here. Well, the DBR here. Welcome to Hamadville Horror. Uh, thank you for visiting. Uh, I am Clint. I am Don. And today we are joined with a very distinguished guest, I would say. Uh, we are here with uh, someone who is uh, very well known to, to most uh, anyone who's ever watched uh, a, a horror movie that they may have picked up at a video store. Uh, we're talking to Mr. Brian Usna today. How are you doing, sir? Good. How are you? Oh, my Fantastic. goodness. Fantastic. This is kind of surreal. I mean, uh, having you on here, it's... Uh, um i i mean i'm not even joking i mean uh, anybody who walked the the video aisles you know uh looking at the horror section has has come across you know famous artwork of of movies that that you've either you know written uh or directed or or produced you know to some degree um and it's it's pretty fantastic i mean some of the titles that that immediately come to mind you know or uh, reanimator society you know um that one he's got on his back wall, Guyver. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, uh, a guilty pleasure of mine, Ticks. A little, a little known movie, but... <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. And, and you know, it's a, uh, and it's amazing because you could go through the horror section, and then you could turn around and you could go through the kids section, and go to you know, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, and your name's on that. And it's like. That is just absolutely crazy that the the diversity and that's actually one of the things that I made sure that I wanted to ask you was, you know, um, when you were doing this, when you first started off, you know, did you ever imagine that, you know, the, the ends of the spectrum would be that wide, you know, you'd have society and reanimator on, on one side and you've had honey, I shrunk the kids and, and Tarzan, the epic adventures. Did you ever think that it would, you know, be that diverse? Um, well, I just wanted to make movies. And um, I do think that fantasy and horror are two sides of the same coin. If you, you know, if you darken the light in a fantasy movie and make the ending bad, it'll be a horror movie. And vice versa for horror, if you lighten it up and have everybody live at the end, it's a fantasy. So I do think that um, fantasy and horror are connected. And one of the first movies that really, um, really um, affected me when I was a kid was um, The Seven Voids of Sinbad, which is basically a fantasy movie, but it's got monsters and, you know, fighting skeletons and a woman that gets turned into a snake. And so in a way, it's a horror movie as well. Definitely. No, I mean, Clash of the Titans is uh is up there. Jason and Argonauts. I mean, uh, you know, those types of movies. Yeah, I mean, they're uh, especially when you're when you're younger. You know, you uh, you see them, and you don't really think of them as horror. And then as you as you you know you you backtrack, you're like, damn, that was kind of scary when I was a kid. You know, mm -hmm. especially with you know the the Medusa scene in Clash of the Titans. You know, that's a scene that I'll I'll pretty much never forget just because it was. You know, when my me and my dad will watch it, we just turn it on and it was always on that part. And it's like, man, it's just stuck <laughs> in my head. So, yeah, I can definitely understand why uh, why Sinbad would be there. So, yeah, I, I just think it's amazing. You know, there's even something kind of really horrific about or about stop motion. So the way that, you know, her hair, her snaky head, hair moved, the fact that it was a little bit stop motion jerky is almost mm -hmm. that, and that always freaked yeah. me out people it i've always terrifying. been freaked out by that like i'm like it, and it's and and some of the movies actually um i think there's there's a, a gentleman i can't remember his name but uh he's got a newer movie on shutter i think it's called the mad god um oh. it's, it's all it's all stop motion and it's it just came out i think like two or three years ago but it's amazing and it really shows when somebody knows what they're doing like it can it can really work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that he uh, that that was a labor of love, I think. And he made um, tri um, Tippet, Bill Tippet. Yes, he did. Um, well, he actually animated the the ant in Honey I Shrunk the Kids, but he is responsible a lot for um, for Jurassic Park. Originally, they were going to do it with with puppets, 
right and um full size stuff which they did do some mm -hmm. um but um he was the one that was able to show them that he could get digital up to the level where it could it could be realistic and i think jurassic park is the first time that cgi was really successful and tippet was also he was a dinosaur fanatic and you know there's a documentary about it i'm trying to remember the name of it i have to check that out because yeah that's um, it's amazing the work he covered, they covered his career and he um he was a, one of those dinosaur guys and and he got into into stop motion and did stop motion for huge movies um mm -hmm. and this the uh, you know he was able to like move between the stop motion and the um and the and the CGI he also was responsible for starship troopers yep Yep, and yep. is almost credited as a co-director because all those, all those insects, alien insects. I mean, that's kind of the movie, you know. That's um, and uh, and he designed them and and executed it, and I think he even, um, you know, did it sort of the way an action director will take over the action scenes, you know, when the actors are having to react to a whole bunch of nothing mm -hmm. yeah and, you know i think he was he was very heavily involved in that if you if you find that documentary i think it it's one of the documentaries by alexandre philippe he's one of the leading documentary filmmakers now especially in in genre he did the, you know he's done a lot of them. He did the People versus George Lucas. I don't know if you've seen that one. No, yeah. That's an excellent documentary. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I'm going to have to check this out. About how the Star Wars kind of fan geeks turned against George Lucas when he changed the first movie. Yeah. You know, and it brought up questions about should he be able to do that? I mean, of course he should be able to of do course. that. Should he be able to should he be able to destroy all the versions that came before? There's a you know, should somebody who, you know, should, you know, make the Mona Lisa be, be changed, you know, at one point. I don't like it. Yep. Change yep. it. There's a there's an issue here about um at what point the the um the kind of cultural product belongs to the audience and to what degree. Yeah. I can't even remember, honestly, I can't even remember the original Star Wars. Like, I can't even remember how it was before the special edition and then the re-released edition. It's so different than what it used to be. And they're all like that now, you know, all of, all of the original three. It's like, oh. I, I can't remember them. It's difficult because if you want it to be, um, as I said, I think it's fine to, to change it as long as you don't, um, as long as you keep the other versions accessible. Because I really feel like there's, it's, it's just that um, younger audiences, newer audiences can't, um, you know, they can't relate to old movies. Uh, I just went to see Sunday night they, or Saturday night. They had a screening of, um, of the original Jaws in IMAX, IMAX. Chinese theater. I, I live very close to the Chinese. And a bunch of us went to it. And I took my 11-year-old grandson to it, you know, because this movie's 50 years old. Mm -hmm. When I was 11-year-old, a 50 year old movie was like 1911 you know i mean it was like i mean at the beginning of silence so when you think about how old that is culturally you know the yeah. different world we live in now and and jaws it created the um the summer blockbuster before oh, jaws the studios assumed nobody went to the movies in the summer they were too busy at the beach and at the lake 
And then with JAWS, that all changes. And we started, they started building summer into being the big time to go mm -hmm. to movies, you know, yeah. popcorn movies. Yep. And JAWS, even when it came out, was, you know, the shark was a little, a little dicey when you really saw it. Oh, yeah. Oh, but, you yeah. Know, because it's a big, huge piece of rubber, you know. But, you know, they cut it well, and but it's still, and I guess um, they could have decided to go ahead and digitize those shots or enhance them digitally. And I'm not sure that that wouldn't, it very well could make it more accessible to a modern audience, to the, you know, the, you know, Fortnite kids and, you know, they the, got deep blue sea. They don't need to watch Jaws. Leave Jaws alone. <laughs> well, but the thing is, but the movie holds up. Oh, it it's even oh, yeah. scary for, for my grandson. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, you know, but and I can definitely see why Lucas wanted to put in some creatures into the original Star Wars because I don't know. I'm sure that's what he wanted. You know, and I do. I. I I'm not put off by especially the background stuff. Yeah. You know? But and there isn't that much change anyway. No. But the no, um no. but the you know when he changes that you know um on solo um you know doesn't shoot first in the bar. <laughs> that, or the or the job know, of the hut scene. Change. Well that's certainly <laughs> updating the morality of it. Yeah. It's on solo is supposed to be a just a rogue kind of outlaw. Yeah. Yep. And yep. so then that changed as it became such a such a um, successful franchise. But I would think I feel like George Lucas should not be um, too much criticized for what he did on the original Star Wars because he already was so terrible with the third one he did with the Ewoks. Damn it, I knew you were going to say that. I feel that, like man. with that, he might as well go to movie jail anyway. Forget <sighs> adding digital monsters. Damn. That, was, that was just indefensible. Yeah. Just, man. Yeah, he, sh he should have stopped after the Empire Strikes Back. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they just blitzed, <laughs> just blitzed the Ewoks. Uh, man. Well, it was, well, it was just such a such a bald face pandering to the toy makers and kids. And I just feel like, I mean, because I remember Star Wars when it first came out. And I was just, I didn't know anything about it. I saw the poster and I'm like, man, I got to see this. Right. And it was just so great. Um, and then the second one was, you know, more produced even better yeah. and even the fantastic puppet, the puppetry of of um what's the name of the, the, the uh, Tom oh yeah yoda um was amazing for yeah the i mean today all that stuff could be done digitally like yeah that. look at the look at the prequels yeah and but then the third one just and the, the third one was just oh no please <laughs> Their one sucks. Anyway, it was just anyway, saying, anyway, yeah, it's some know, highlights. I liked it. Who cares, right? Who cares? It's Star like, Wars. They're they're space operas, you know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I was uh, trying to prepare for this by by watching a couple of interviews and just listening to some things you had to say to some other people. And and one of the things that that I really enjoyed was a comment that you made about how you knew that you were a horror fan um, where you, you described it uh, briefly that uh, you like movies, but you had a tendency to like good movies. But when it came to horror movies, you liked good horror movies, but you also kind of liked the bad ones. And, and I think that describes a lot of us that are, that are really big fans of, of, of horror movies. And, and we all seem to have a movie that is, is one that maybe we're, it's a guilty pleasure. Do you have a, a bad horror movie that comes to mind that is one of your favorites? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I, I there's so many bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
You're not lying. Huh? You're not there's lying. So, there's so many years to, to, to scan in your mind. If one comes up, I'll mention it. <laughs> what are the okay. ones that you like that are bad? Well, you know, I like... I kind of, I kind of hate to bring them up because it's, it's like, uh, I don't even really want to call them bad. I like them so much. Um, um, ticks comes to mind. I, <laughs> ticks I, is great. I, I rather enjoy yeah, that one. It's certainly, it's certainly on the edge. But, uh, <laughs> you know, recently I, I, I uh, got to see uh, Clint Howard at a, at a horror convention and I, I, I picked that photo is still of him from that movie with his face all swelled up, you know, with, uh, with, uh, tick larvae. And, um, and he said, you know, I almost wasn't in that movie. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he's like, that scene was written in, you know, uh, was, as a way was, to tie the story was, together. It was shot after the yeah. movie was cut together. Yeah. And I was just fascinated yeah. by that because that's my takeaway from the movie was that scene. Yeah, you know that's that's stuff. probably my my favorite part of the film mm -hmm. they know, had a different uh, director of photography before yeah. it too yeah jock haken was the dp for that scene mm -hmm. and jock haken like shot he was the dp for, DP for like nightmare on island street the hit and the, you know all these big kind of horror movies he did, for some reason he never um got up into the into the studio level but he's just an incredible uh, no doubt but clint's great and that movie had him and his father in it, it had rance howard in it. wow that's awesome that's a that's a great that's a great movie he oh, produced yeah. one clint that um mm. holds near and dear to my heart not saying it's bad but has <laughs> bad memories and that's dolls my oh. my sister and I kid you not, Brian, my sister knew that I was scared shitless of dolls after this movie. <laughs> and she, so when, where we lived, my room was, when you walked down the hallway, it was to the left and hers was straight back. So I had to look at her room before I went to mine. She would line up baby dolls at the threshold of her door every single night for three years straight. And I would not go near her room. Like I would run to my room because of that movie. So that has scarred me for life. Um, well, that's a, that's a, it's not, it definitely isn't one of the best um, or the more, more complete movies I've been involved with. But almost everything that Stuart Gordon directed always had, there was a certain quality there. Oh, yeah. And uh, the thing about dolls was that it's really Hansel and Gretel, you know? so it's a it's a fairy tale, you know, and it has a lot of violence, and the and the um, but fairy tales do have violence. This is true. I, I was you know I read fairy tales when, when I, as soon as I learned to read I read I read books that were all the, um, the Hans Christian Andersen and Grimm brothers. And uh, and I was fascinated by them because they were just like, unlike anything else, they weren't stories that fit kind of this ethical, moral kind of presentation that you're used to when you're mm -hmm. a kid. All the stories have a little message to them. About They're terrifying. Behavior and stuff. Yeah, I mean, people kill each other and they turn <laughs> into animals and... And like Hansel and Gretel, the mother, like the father leaves them out in the woods to die. You know, I mean, you know, the witch is going to eat them. I mean, yeah. fairy tales. The Little Mermaid, like I yeah. love the yeah. fact that Disney gets a hold of the properties and everybody thinks that these things are just rainbows and unicorns. And you go back and read these things and these uh, some of the and a lot of these got animated. And I remember Little Mermaid did. And that was terrifying, flat out terrifying. Like every time they they said and they and they said it in the book. Every time she'd take a step, once she got her legs, it felt like she was walking on glass. And mm. then she turns the sea foam at the end. Like, damn, that's far cry away from Disney. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, Disney. I mean, 
um, Disney Pinocchio. Oh, scary as hell. I mean, yeah, that is scary. So you're not lying. Not many, many punches pulled on that. No, no. The boys at all. Will turn into donkeys because <laughs> they're smoking cigars and playing pool and not going to school. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't that. get much darker than that. That's pretty scary. Yeah, you know? yeah. I agree. But but really the the, the Disney the original Disney. Um, feature animations were there was always kind of a dark side to it as well as a light side. In I mean, in um, Snow White, the first one, my God, the mother hires a guy to kill her and bring back her heart, her heart in a jar. You know, and she hires the guy to go kill her, and he just doesn't do it. And the, the mother is like witch that's jealous of her own daughter and will kill her because her daughter's prettier than her. And the night that she's in the forest, it's really scary. You know, it's yeah. like right on Bald Mountain or something. So I think that family film, I mean, uh, I think family fantasy kids films, there's, you know, they're always better when there's a, a dark part of it as well. I think when you... Yeah. Oh, my little ponies with it. It's not, it's not as it's not satisfying. And a and a kid's entertainment that has those aspects is enjoyable to an adult. I mean, I I could watch those early Disney features now. You know, they're you know, I love Dumbo, right? Oh, God. It's pretty, yeah. pretty funny, you know. So I think that, you know, the idea of making really really um, just lightweight type of kids entertainment you know I, I remember being scared of um of the wizard of oz the first time i saw it oh yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, flying monkeys I had nightmares about that witch on the roof i mean oh, my god she was melting and there's monkeys flying around and drop you from the sky yeah that's i don't know I mean, it's you're, you're, i'm right there with you <laughs> like that's that's legit for you yeah. know like you said a, a light-hearted the, the apple movie. trees always got me in that one but think, <laughs> yeah but i think that is uh, I, mean, I think that's where fantasy and horror you know they do they do communicate yeah. with one another and i think that you're you know making family films or fantasy family films doesn't mean you're you know, it doesn't mean you're doing like a dog's Christmas or, you know, it doesn't, yeah. there's different types of it. And I think that, you know, for example, I think people who like dog movies probably like all the bad dog movies. Yeah, well, probably. I like the good dog movies. You know, yeah. I'll watch a dog movie. Oh, yeah. I want it to, uh, be, I want it to be good. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it, it, it certainly is, does seem to be true that, that, um, it doesn't matter what situation or genre you're talking about. I mean, it doesn't take very much to uh, cause it to dive into a horror element. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things that Don and I talk about quite often, you know, horror is one of those genres that you can basically mix with just about any other type of movie and you can be successful with it. I mean, it's. Um, well, it did, you know, horror did get co-opted quite a bit by, mm -hmm. by action movies first. When I was growing up, um, horror was the only place you got that, you know. Yeah, and I still think it's true today. Not to die, you know. And then with uh, movies like, especially Rambo, um, kind of was the big one that established it. I mean, Rambo, uh, and I'm not talking about first blood, especially with the Rambo sequel. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy just, he was like Jesus Christ or something, getting crucified. And they put gore in the, in the action movies. I mean, maybe, um, you know, the, the Wild Bunch yeah. certainly did it a lot earlier than that. Um, Peck and Pod started, you know, you might have been, well have been watching Dawn of the Dead as far as the blood bags go. And they were both about the same time. And it could have been, you know, every, everybody ascribes it to the idea that, that coming from the Vietnam War, people were coming back and they'd seen a lot of 
a lot of um, real injuries. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then with, I think Dawn of the Dead had was the first one that really took advantage of it. Before that, oh yeah, the, um, the, before that, the blood and horror was kind of like the um, you know Ten Thousand Maniacs or Door Door Girls or you know the, where it was just so so ridiculous, you know? right? But with Dawn of the Dead um, and Day of the Dead and stuff, you started seeing these. Uh, these really cool um, gore with, you know, and using the techniques that Dick Smith was teaching everybody. You know, he had this effects school and he was, you know, teaching all these young metalheads how to, how to use um, rubber effects. And um, Tom Sabini, who did the, who did, um, who did, Dawn of the Dead, you know, he came, he was in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. right. He came photographer. back and he did this kind of stuff. And he really just wanted to be an actor. But he was too successful as an effects artist. Oh, yeah. And I think Peckinpah, I mean, if you've ever watched The Wild Bunch, that's a cowboy movie. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a cowboy movie, but wow, it's got more in it. And I think action started delivering gore. And that kind of took a little bit of the, you know, the horror movies started having to compete with that. <laughs> because yeah. horror movies used to they have them had had that market cornered. Mm -hmm. you know? And then of course horror yeah, has gone kind of mainstream. And so it really is hard to make, you know, the kind of horror movies that I, you know, I prefer that sort of you know, sort of um you know, horror movies that sort of went over the line, the transgressive ones, the <laughs> ironic ones. And then once you start, once you've got Night of the Living Dead on AMC TV, it's the most popular series ever, yep. The Walking Dead. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's like horror, it's the zombies, but it's really a soap opera. Exactly. Um, Exactly. And then you kind of go, God, the soap operas have sort of co-opted horror. Now what do you do with it? And now, of course, horror has to be, you know, it's all message forward. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, cool. And that's what kind of, in my mind, sort of was one of the, the unfortunate things that happened to um, George Romero was that he made those early horror movie well, with Night of the Living Dead, which mm -hmm. I consider to be the beginning of the modern age of horror. So if you're going to make a corner that's turned, I would say that's the movie that began this, this time of horror. And, um, and then with Dawn of the Dead, with the shopping mall, mm -hmm. everybody started telling him that he was making social statements. And as, as a Back in the 80s, when I'd go to, or 90s, I'd go to um, these horror festivals in Europe. And we, I remember one um, French um, journalist once told me, you know, after hours, he said, you know, sometimes we just like to have fun with the horror directors. And we'll ask them, do you consider yourself a political filmmaker? And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, well, yes, I have lot to say you know all of a sudden it's like no you're not just making a, whole, a movie about people cutting each other's heads off and coming back to life you're you're making a very serious state mm -hmm. and i think that happened to romero with day of the dead it was yeah. just him he was just all full of this idea that he was making a a social statement and i like the movie because of Tom Savini's scenes. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's got some of the best Savini stuff ever. And then poor George, I mean, not poor George Romero, I mean, his success kind of, um, you know, he had, it's sort of like the deal with the devil, you know, where he, you can make the best horror movie of all time, but you've got to keep making it over and over and over and over again. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, he, he had chances, 
Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You know, he did the monkey movie and the, the Stephen King one and stuff. And But remember, after um, Night of the Living Dead, he made Night Riders with Tom Savini about a bunch of motorcycle guys that yeah. were kind of like... Uh, the Renaissance Fair. Yeah. <laughs> that movie's so incredible. It's not like he was determined to just make horror movies. Yeah. It's like Dennis Pioli, yeah. Stuart Gordon's writing partner, told me one. He said, you know, people talk to me. I say, you know, Stuart and I, because Stuart Gordon was a theater director and Dennis was in the theater from the time he was in college at the University of Wisconsin through 10 or 12 years in Chicago where he was the creative director of the organic theater. So Stuart was an accomplished um, theater director before we made Reanimator. So Reanimator was my first movie. It was his first movie, but I I had no qualifications whatsoever. That he was like a professional director, and I think that's one of the things. One of the reasons people are astonished by Reanimator is we're not used to seeing a cheapo kind of over the top horror movie. It's so well done, so well directed. And, um, but Dennis said, you know, Stuart and I, we could have done anything. We did all kinds of stuff, but you wanted to do horror, so we did horror. And then, of course, it was so successful, they had to keep going doing horror. Mm -hmm. right. And in yeah. a way, I think that happened to George Romero, too. I think that he, he may be, I mean, it came natural to him, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But I think he also wanted to do the Night Riders. He wanted to do, you know, other stuff. And very few, I think, horror directors are able to break out of it or even get into the into the big leagues. I mean, even John Carpenter, you know, yeah. his his least successful movies are the are like the memoirs of the invisible man and stuff. Yeah. Goes the to more, Mars. Somehow, the more the budget, the bigger the the financing, the harder it is to. If somehow they lose, the director loses, or the filmmaker loses. I don't know. Like his focus. Touch. Yeah. Well, we've all and we, me and Clint have talked about that numerous times. You know these uh these indie movies um that, that <clears throat> excuse me that are out. They don't have big budgets at all. I mean, you're lucky if. You get ten, twenty thousand dollars, and you know, but you have to, you have to make sure that 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 it counts for something. When you have a a bloated budget, it's just like we can do anything. It's like we can we can we can cut corners here, there, everywhere. But when you when you only have ten thousand dollars to work with, you got to make it to work. make it you count. Get, you got to make every single penny count, every single shot, every single actor you well, get. Also, every... also, the bigger the budget, the more you have to go for a mainstream audience. Some people can do it, and it's harder for others. Sam Raimi, I think, is one of the few real down-home horror directors who was able to do it. And yeah. him, Bob Tapper, his producing partner, I mean, they made, you know, Evil Dead. Yeah. And then when he got the bucks to make Evil Dead 2, he just did it again, but better. You know, yeah. it was like, wow. And mm -hmm. then, and when he tried to make, what did they do? The X Y C killers, killing, mm -hmm. murderers, mm -hmm. or whatever. That was, you know, it, it faltered. Which you know, but and and um, what's the Dark Man was oh. a cheap, a cheap superhero movie with a vision that then paid off when they did Spider Man. Yep. Yeah. They did Xena, and they did. I mean. Yeah, and he tried to hit the A team, the, you know, the, the A list with um, a simple plan, mm -hmm. you know, because you know you kind of want to be the guy that they bring the biggest projects to, you know. But genre, you know, you just end up in the genre. It's hard to break. It's hard to get out of it. And yeah. I think even Wes Craven, I, I guess he did that violin. Well, even, I mean, even look at yourself too. I mean, you know, like you said, you know, you, you mean, we've talked about it. You did reanimator. You did, you know, it was from beyond Then, honey, I shrunk the kids. So you got, I mean, you got a taste of being outside of, of horror, well, you know, so. I had a chance. I had a chance with 
um, honey, I shrunk the kids. But I, um, you know, I stayed right down in the trenches. I mean, not because not because I wanted to. You know, I would much rather have a, I'd love to have a hundred, two hundred million dollar budget. Why not? I mean, you get right. to be kidding. But right. I also ended up, well, you know, I didn't really know about Hollywood when I came out here. I And I didn't have any, I never took a class in film or anything like that. And I didn't even start, I didn't even decide to try to make movies till I was in my 30s. I, I made The Animator when I was like, Yes, it's thirty-five. You know, yeah. I mean, that, that you're almost. I mean, you're getting to the end of your youth there. <laughs> uh, you're not forty-five, but you know. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, but it, you know, people who you know, Spielberg directed Jaws when he was probably like twenty-five years old. He started doing TV. He went to USC. You know, Coppola. Um, you know, Lucas. They were all. Carpenter even went to USC. They were all there. And people have this idea from the time they're very young. I didn't, you know. Yeah. I was nowhere around that kind of business. What do I know? For that? I didn't know you could do that. You could make money making movies. That didn't even occur to me. You know, you got to be around it. And a lot of people like Clint Howard, they grew up in the business. And some of my favorite actors, at least the ones I've worked with, are the ones that come from Hollywood families. That there are a few generations in LA, in Hollywood, and their and their grandfather or their great grandfather or their uncle or somebody, they were a different or their uh or their they would be actors or they worked in different capacities on movies. So they are, they're just, it's, it's in their blood. It's, mm -hmm. they know the scene. And, but if you don't grow up with that, and this is, just, I mean, now you can look at YouTube, and you, can, you know, the internet brings so many things so close to you mm -hmm. that you, you know, people are aware of how you make a movie because everybody's making movies all the time. That's not the way it used to be. Not oh, when yeah. I was growing up. So it was a very special thing that you would not know. You could get a book, maybe, but books were always out of date. So I think that I think that there's a, um, you know, to the, the way the way that I did it was totally out of ignorance, and I was very lucky to have gotten to kind of make a living at it. But I had no idea what the studios were. I mean, I knew the names. I knew that they were, you know, I moved to LA, I saw the studio mm -hmm. and I wanted to, you know, but I didn't, I, I never even had an agent you know, or a manager or anything like that. Cause I thought I'm a producer, I do my own thing. And I think you, I think to a certain degree, some people like me are, I, I guess, too egotistical or too um, you know, ignorant or something. I I just wanted to be the boss, you know. Yeah. And that means you're gonna have to find a pond small enough for you to be the big fry. <laughs> if you want to work in the big time, right? Yeah. A different story, you know. You've got to, you know, it's a much more political element, you know. Oh yeah. 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 And it's hard. Even Stuart Gordon, who was so talented, he just couldn't crack, you know, the studio. And he had, and he had a housekeeping deal at Disney after Honey and Throw the Kids, and couldn't get a movie going. He finally got one going, which was the, uh, ama the amazing ice cream suit, the Spray Bradbury story that he had adapted to a play when he was at the Organic Theater in Chicago, and um, it was almost like, you know. It was very low budget for for a studio. It would have been a huge budget for me, and um, he just he couldn't crack it. Even though he was so talented, because at the Organic Theater and we made movies, you know, there wasn't there weren't all these big powers and big people that you had to maneuver around and make alliances with. We did whatever we wanted, you know, with Reanimator. I raised the money for it. 
I had the last say. Yeah. yeah right. It wasn't like, you know, I didn't give it to the MPAA because I knew that they would they would cut stuff. To butcher it. I said, then I'm not yeah. going to do that. Well, I just didn't want to do it because I want to be the boss. And when we, most of the movies I've made, you do, if you're not paying for it, you have to negotiate, whatever level it's at. Yep. Whoever's paying for it is you know, kind of calls to the tune. Um, right. And, you have to satisfy them. Yeah. And even if you're paying for it, you have to negotiate with the people who, you know, the director. And the, and you you got to let people do their jobs and you can't, you can't have people who, who just will do what you say. Otherwise, right. you might as well do it all. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah. the but I'm not saying that any movie ever has just like one voice. But when you don't pay for it, then you have to convince whoever's paying for it that your decisions are should be followed. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes everybody's on board and sometimes they're not. And of course, we would like to think that that the movies, or I would like to think that the movies I've been involved with that aren't that weren't completely successful um, were it was because of the you know that I couldn't just do whatever I want. But that's stupid. But that's what we like to you know. That's what we tell ourselves. Sure. We're, you know, I. Personally, I try to analyze movies, the ones I've made and the ones and when I see something, and try to decide why, you know, why things are the way they are, based on my experience. And I've worked in a lot of different countries with a lot of different types of financing. So on the one hand, I'm not familiar with the big time, but I'm very familiar with the little guy, you know. Yeah. You know? As as Bo Finger says, we don't have clout. <laughs> right. I don't know if you ever watched Bo Finger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bo Finger, the Steve Martin, yep. Eddie Murphy movie. That's the story of my life. When I see that, I said, "That's the that's the spirit of my career." <laughs> that's a good spirit to have, then. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's, I mean, of course, it's a huge satire, but he really gets a lot. <laughs> He gets a lot right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I I think that there's a lot of people out there, like aspiring filmmakers, who could who could probably take a class from you on on how to, uh, you know, do just about any aspect of filmmaking. You know, and and I, I especially liked one of the things that that you had mentioned before. Um, like I said in a different interview that I watched, uh, that um, you know you can you can finance a movie you can make the best thing that that you know how to make you know but if nobody ever sees it you know it's a it's still a failure so i mean uh, the interesting thing to me is that you were able to maintain so much control in the creative process either by raising the the funding or finding a way to avoid going to uh you know uh a review board for to cut your movie all to hell you know and you still found a way to distribute it so people can see it i mean that's remarkable to me. You know, you didn't just make a movie. You found a way to get it out there for people to see it. And um, is that... Well, you know, the business of movies is business, you know? Yeah. I think that's... I think for me, I started by putting up my own money. Mm -hmm. And I had put my money up on a number of different types of businesses. And so... And I had kids. <laughs> you can't afford to lose your money. No. And yeah. so for me, I started by trying to figure out you know, I want to make a movie because I love them, but I want to get my money back. And so that, once I saw how the international sales work back in the 80s and the video, I thought, oh, I can see how this could be a business. Before that, I couldn't quite, I just thought, how do you make money off this? And, and I think right now, it's even hard, it's, it's harder now than it was in the eighties to make money on you. Oh my God. It's yes. Easier now than it was in the eighties to make a movie because anybody can make a movie with their phone with, you know, they can download after effects and final cut and, 
they can go on YouTube and get all these tutorials. Yep. And you can just, I mean, information is there. You can shoot without having to get put lights on the subject. I mean, all these things have a a burdensome side as well. One side of it is you can make a movie without ever involving a professional. Mm -hmm. First movie I made, I was the only one that didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> Everybody else worked for a living, you know? And the people who did a lot of the technical parts of the movie were experienced. So today you do a movie and you can have nobody experience. And that's that's makes it more difficult. But just to make a movie, gosh, anybody can do it anywhere. No questions asked. Mm -hmm. But can you turn it into money? If you made a movie in the 80s, you could at least put it on VHS. Yep. Yep. And sell it. You know, you could do that. It was physical stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a value to having 90 minutes of entertainment. And if you made it exploitative, which was my theory, was horror, sex and blood. It's going to sell. Well, just don't be, don't, don't hold, you know, try to make it, you know, try to go for the gusto, you know, don't yeah. try to make it respectable. What, yeah. what I noticed in the 80s and 70s was that the movies that didn't work, the cheap, indie movies that didn't work for me if they do a horror movie but somehow they try to make it respectable they didn't want to make it too exploitative and and i thought that's a mistake because i know that people like me will go for it if it if it push if it's exploitative yeah, yeah. and if you try to be respectable it's not interesting. And for the people that you're looking for respect for, I don't know who they are. They're not. <laughs> they're damn, you know, horrible. So I think that there's a, you know, back then, I think you could make money. Um, mm -hmm. But you could be hard to make a movie. You could yeah. make money if you did one. Today, with streaming, even big time producers are, they're going crazy because with streaming, there's no way to, there's no profit participation. Mm -hmm. There's no way when it goes to the theaters, you can say so much money came in. There, it's listed, you know, there's there's accountings for how much came in and yeah. what your percentage is. Mm -hmm. With streaming, the streamer makes the movie, they don't even tell anybody how many people look at it. Yeah. And um, and the only movies that they care about are the ones that drive subscribers because their value of their company is proportional to how many new subscribers they're getting. Yep. Now, if you'd go to the or whatever it's called, where they have ad supported mm -hmm. screen, yeah, you can you get money because they they sell ads just the way like YouTube, right? They sell yeah. ads. Mm -hmm. but, um, but with you know Netflix and you know HBO Plus, Amazon. All those, they don't tell you, you know, they don't publish records about how many people have seen the movie. And there's no, they, there's no quantification or, of what the monetization of the movie is. It's, it's very vague. Mm -hmm. And so people think, oh, if they get their movie on Netflix or something, they somehow a big success. Nope. Well, Netflix pays. Yeah, bills. maybe for Netflix, but not they for you. Know, they pay nothing for it. And maybe you can be very proud because your movie's there, but you're better off selling it on your website. Or yeah. Something. Distribution's a big physical it, copies because you're not going to get it, you know, they're not going to give you much for it. It wow. isn't worth anything. Wow. Distribution's a huge thing. Yeah. So I think that's that's the negative part of today. It's just it's too hard to make money from, right. from you know, even for the even for real established producers, I was oh, reading yeah. something today about that. But they're oh, yeah. trying you to figure only... out. I think they're, they're. I think the producers guild is wants to unionize. <laughs> they yeah. want to somehow withhold their services from the studios until they can, um, you know, until they can um, come to an agreement about who gets what. You know? 
Yeah, yeah. no doubt about how it. How you define it? This, how you define it is the thing. Yeah. Would you hold one second? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And with um, with the um, you know, you can put out VHSs. There are people who want to collect. You can Blu-rays, collectors' editions. You know, I do a lot of um, I do a lot of extras for yeah. Blu-rays. You know, yeah. and yes, you it's do. you know, you get the Blu-ray. Some people want that Blu-ray. They don't want to stream it. It's a movie that they love. And they'll buy it five times every time they come out with 4K and 8K and whatever. And then part of what you sell is that it's restored. And that's going to people who, who care enough to buy a really good player, which you don't even need in this life because no. you can whatever you want, probably. And then you have to have a, a system to watch it on. So you either get a you know, one of those, I don't know what they call OLEDs. OLEDs. Thing or, or like me, I've always had a projection. A projector. Yeah, yeah. And um, so if, you, if you're that type of person and you like to see the extras, you know, you can do that. Just like going to the movies. I'll go to old movies when they have the director there or the actor and they'll talk about it. They'll have a Q&A. And I, that, that's, it's great to go see some movie you like and, and have someone who's involved with it talk about it. Um, it's better than just watching it, you know, at home. Well, you've done it a couple that's times. It's a that... very small, it's a small audience. It's, that's a small market. Yeah. You're not going to pay for, your, if you make your movie for $30,000, you might get your money back. Maybe. Yeah. If you're making it for a million dollars, I'm not. I don't think you can Doubt get it. enough Blu-ray sales. Yeah, that's you're gonna yeah. be you're gonna be hard pressed. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, most people who make movies, that you know, indie movies, uh, um, they do it because one, because they just want to do, it. and two, because they think maybe they will get recognized and they will be. Hired to do a big movie or a bigger movie. up up yeah. the ladder. Yeah, yeah, but they're gonna they're gonna yeah. they're gonna get into a club. They're gonna be recognized. Yeah. Their efforts will be recognized. And you know, unfortunately, there really is no club. But if you're gonna get successful, you just have to do it. You have to be successful on your own, and then you're mm -hmm. your own club. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You yeah. Your own business. Unless you have the kind of connections and and pedigree that you can yeah. somehow work your way up, usually it, uh, it, to do it through the indie thing is, I think, much more difficult than just to go to work for a big studio or a big company and see if you can see if you've got the you know yeah. the, the yeah. wherewithal to like fight your way to try right. to fight your way up. Yeah, like you know, like the guy who did, um, who direct, who ended up directing Honey I Shrunk the Kids, Joe Johnston. When Stuart Gordon quit, they looked for another guy, and Joe Johnston had had, had never directed a feature. He was a storyboard artist, and had directed second unit for movies like Willow. He worked on these Spielberg, Lucas type movies, and. The reason he got the job was because Spielberg and Lucas, on the phone, recommended him. Wow. So if you've been working with Guillermo del Toro and, I don't know, who's really big now? Christopher <laughs> Nolan? Yeah, yeah. And you've been do, working hard for them and, and getting in the group. Right. And then somebody says, hey, we want to do this little movie, which... Honey, I'm sure the kids was a little movie back then. And Christopher Nolan says, um, yeah, yeah, I want those guys from that podcast. 
you might get that kind of job. You still have to perform. You still have to. Right. Oh yeah, that's that's job. what people don't understand right there. It's like just because you get that recommendation, you don't slack ass. Like you better you better perform because now their name's on the line as well as yours. So no. Um, yeah, I work. We were. I I um, have a kind of a little ad hoc company with a, a partner of mine who wrote. I met him when he wrote um, um, the Return of Living Dead Three. Mm -hmm. Don Petty. Yeah. And, um, and we, under the banner of a thing called Dark Art. Dark we Art. Yeah. Sometimes help people, you know, like no budget guy, no budget people that aren't in it. Normally they're not here, some of them are. But it's we just act as their reps for a percentage in, in order to do basically the first thing is to avoid to so that they don't fall, you know, get taken the way I did when I came out, reanimated. I, I didn't get the money from that movie. Because I didn't know how to make a sales deal. And I was dealing with a ethically challenged company called Empire. Mm -hmm. And so I took me two years of lawsuit, six figures, lawyers, to just get the movie back. But the, I didn't get the money for it. And that's because I was, like everybody else who comes out to Hollywood, I was a sheep coming to be sheared. And people come out and they just want in. They're ready mm -hmm. to, to take a fall yeah. as long as they get in the door. And so nobody knows how to make a deal for, for, for you know, a sales agent deal or a distribution deal. So what we do is we just advise them and help them find that. Right, but right. Then, of course, we inevitably get involved with trying to help, depending on how early it comes, we prefer to get, in help, get involved before they even write the script. Oh, yeah. So at least they're... At least they're doing something because they're going to make the movie anyway for yeah, no money. Right. They'll make it for no money. And some of them are more, some of them are kind of more kind of real budgets, but some of them are just like no budget. And yeah. but they're dealing, you know, they're not in LA. So where they are, they're not going to get good actors. And most people that they're dealing with might be somehow in audiovisual industries, but there's this there's a kind of a cinema IQ, I think, that I don't know if you either get you either have it or you don't. I'm sure it's learnable, but it's you know, I, I'm trying to remember who the there's a professional basketball player who um and they were talking to him about this young guy just coming from college, top, top pick. And he said, Well, can you Get him to work, you know, is he gonna work out? He says, Look at I can teach him everything I know, but you can't teach basketball IQ. There's a and there's I think there's a cinematic IQ. Some people look at movies and when they start getting into it, they learn how you tell a story in a movie. And some people somehow that eludes them. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's it, crazy. It becomes a yeah. series of shots and scenes and somehow it just i don't know why i i do think it must be communicable <laughs> you yeah. must be. to a certain extent it has it's to probably be. easier if you're in a place like los angeles where you there's so many people like you trying to do the same thing and then you and you start you make your short or whatever you do and your friends will be the most brutal critics oh yeah oh yeah you'll be you're in you're swimming with the fish then yeah and you know i think you learn a lot from that whereas if you're you know in, you know outside chicago i don't know um, indiana south pennsylvania Carolina, pittsburgh south pittsburgh i mean you can you can be a, the people who are in any kind of part of audiovisual business can get away with acting like they know a lot, but they don't. You know, they don't necessarily necessarily have know exactly what is um, you know what's the you know what what amounts to 
telling a movie story. Mm -hmm. But if you're, you know, in New York City with plays or in LA with movies, it's hard to, you know, your own peers will, you you're, you know, they'll they'll let you know because yeah. everybody's working on big movies, and at night they're going to do their movie, and they're, you know, they're everybody's trying to get an agent, and and you're right in the soup. And I think maybe you learn more from osmosis than mm -hmm. you from somebody trying to to say, well, listen, this is, you know, this is why the story should go where or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway, that. it's a, it's, but it, it is interesting though, because I, I mm. just see movies that people do for no money. They're pretty, yeah, they can be good. We've seen a few. Oh, yeah. yeah. We've seen a few. We've seen a few done for very little. Um, well, I mean, that that's a really cool um, uh, business uh, venture that you have going there. Um, I, I did. Well, we're doing it. Don't it. get me, don't get me wrong. We're not doing it out of some altruistic. Um, no, I'm sure there's something. We're, in doing it. It. <laughs> we're doing it because I hate to see all these neat people using their own money to make all yeah. these cheap movies. And I can't do a micro budget movie. Right, I can't get people to work for me for nothing. You know, oh, right. I can't do that. So it's yeah. just sort of a way to get your your finger yeah. into the pudding. Yeah, put in the door. Do you, do you feel like you've had some success stories since you've been doing that? Well, I mean, we've we've gotten some movies made, and they've gotten money back. You know, and it's, well, that's the name of the game, right? Yeah, that's that's uh -huh. that's the goal is <laughs> that's the name of the game. <laughs> we'll see. You know, for some people, it's just enough to get their movie into international festivals and stuff like that. But see, that doesn't do us anything. Right, right. We just get a percentage of what they earn. <laughs> so if all they're earning is is um, being proud of winning a festival or something, <laughs> I don't. You know, yeah, you get a percentage of happiness. <laughs> I, I like the idea of. of Keeping score by the bank account. You know, yeah, no, no doubt. Like, Me too. Know, right. It's like the hustler with Paul Newman. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, Minnesota Fats. Becky Gleason tells him after one long night of playing, and Paul Newman is obviously better than him. Minnesota Fats tells him, you know, says the way we keep score in this game is who has the most money to win. <laughs> God, I love that movie. Some truth. You may have there. all the moves, but right, who's got all the money? All this money. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, from your personal experience, uh, just a general curiosity, just kind of a fun question: um, Is there a movie idea that you've always wanted to pursue, but you just never got it made? Oh, I don't know, five or six hundred of them. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I mean. I've got there one I've got, one you I've still believe files, in that maybe you want to try file boxes full of <laughs> yeah. yeah and yeah. stuff that are developed some yeah, developed yeah. quite a lot quite far yeah there's a lot of them okay. but it's not like i mean i wouldn't uh, romanticize it in in the uh, in the way of saying it's my dream project and you know it's not that it's just that <laughs> there's a lot of stuff a lot of projects we yeah. developed me with different groups of people yeah. to to try to be hey Dagon, I was developing that for 13 years before it got made. Yeah. You just have to find the money for the right project. You know, yeah. it's it's a uh, I, I've always made I I think almost every movie I've made has started with the money. Sure. And then we found the project. Oh. You know I, I I haven't had that much luck with Here's my great idea, and I'm going to go knock on the door and, yep, pitch. and sell the idea. Why, yeah. would any, why would anybody do that for me? They don't. Somebody who has the wherewithal to make a movie, they want to do their own thing. That's true. Now, certainly, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids is the exception to that because we pitched it to Disney and they went for it. But right. most of them, Reanimator, I had the financing, I was looking for a movie. Stuart Gordon had a TV script for Reanimator, and I and we developed it into a movie with, um, you know, dolls. We had a, then we had the financing from the company to make 
three movies and we just had to decide what the projects would be. And the same thing goes when I went to Spain, um, I was I had to find four projects so we could take it to market and we didn't make any of them. We just went to the market with them. And what two of them, well, three of them were scripts. One was a title, which was Reanimator of Sequel. And, um, and of course, we had to redo the scripts. But I mean, when I went to Spain, I was looking for a giant, a giant insect, like a monster movie that would, that would, you know, because I didn't want to make all this strict horror. And um, so I looked for scripts and I found someone sent me one about a giant alien spider. I said, okay, that fits that fits that idea. Let's adapt it to our circumstances. Um, I mean, a lot of them are like that. With the dead, with Return of the Living Dead 3, the company had bought the rights to the sequel to the to Re Return of the Living Dead. Right. Bought the rights to do a third one. Yeah. And asked me to make it. And then I interviewed writers and picked a writer off a pitch, and then we developed it into a movie. And the only thing I knew was that I wanted it, I wanted the the living dead to be the main character, you know, and John Penny's pitch um, worked for that. So, and then after we made it, the head of the company said, what do you want to do next? I said, what do you want to do next? Because, I know he'll make his movie. And he said, I want to make a movie called The Dentist. Said, okay, let's make a movie called The Dentist, you know? And that's how that, it wasn't like, I was like, oh, I got a movie about a dentist. I, I, I wanted to, I got to make a movie because I've got four kids, you know? Right, right. That's a it's, smart it's, move. And you know what else is funny too is that, you know, like a lot of people, you know, like they always hear Reanimator and it's, you know, obviously it was, 85 you know but a lot of people don't understand too is that you know like beyond reanimator came out in 2003 like that's not even that old of a movie and same thing with dagon that was what 2001 yeah well they're 20 years old yeah it's years is pretty old that's it's pretty old but you a hear lot that of name fans reanimator. aren't even 20 years old that's true that's true, true. you know Horror fans start at like 13. Yeah, that's, that and by true. the time they're 23, they start falling off. Right. You know? yeah, that's the true. The ones who continue being horror fans into their later life usually were somehow infected by some movie early on. Yeah. 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 Oh, infected by movies. Infected. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I like your position on on there's something about a horror movie that steps over the line. I mean, those are the ones that really stick with you. And and I have to say that if you do the number of times in a month that I reference the shunting, you would probably roll your eyes so hard they fall out of your head. Well, it's, you know it's, I mean? called, it's called being transgressive. <laughs> there you go. In Reanimator, it's the head giving head. Yep. So yes. That's trend. When you see that, you go crazy. Oh yeah. You know, oh, you yeah. say yeah. this shit is too weird, right? You know? <laughs> and I'll watch it again. The then you don't ever forget that. It, exactly. Actually, almost every movie you should try to put a scene in it that people will talk about, right? Oh yeah, so that it's not, you know, because you can't depend on it actually being a good movie, right? Right. But you've got to have scenes that work. I mean, if every scene works, then you've got a great movie. Then you've got The Godfather or something, right? But right. If you aren't going to, if you're, I mean, you can try to make a, a, a great movie every time out. I've never known anybody who didn't, well, maybe some, but generally anybody who makes a movie is just trying to shoot for the moon. They're just doing the best they can. For one reason or another, it works out. Sometimes for me, generally, a lot of things that fail are because I try to do too much with no um, with, you know, with less resources than needed or less talented, resource of talent than needed. Uh, sometimes that's me. <laughs> you know, I can be not talented enough for this project, but 
there, but generally you're trying real hard, you know, yeah. but at least have stuff in it that people uh, yeah. reference so they don't forget it. Yeah. You know, don't it's, forget it. it's courageous to take risks like that. I, uh, well, I have to I admire that quite a bit. You yeah. have to separate yourself from the, from the herd. And that's one thing that I can, I can say you've, you've definitely done. I mean, reanimator that stands, that stands on its own, you know, any day of the week. I mean, I'm one of those people that, that I, I bought it twice. Um, I got the one edition I had, you know, Jeffrey Combs and Barbara Crampton sign it. Um, you know, I, I mean, the movie is just, it's, it's a classic. I love it. I, yeah, I these, horror, it. these horror actors make just a living out of signing. Just goes to show you if you're in front of the camera, people will pay for your autograph. I would pay for your autograph even so, you're behind. No, but you're, I'm saying yeah. it's a lot, it's a lot <laughs> less. It's a lot, it, it goes down. Yeah. But there's an inverse side of that, which is that I believe that the amount of money you make on a movie is inversely proportionate to how close you get to the camera. So I can the see people that. who real, you know, a director will pay you to direct the movie. Yeah. You know. <laughs> A star actor will pay you to be that star, you know? I'm not right. talking about when you get to the studio system. Right. But in general, if you're getting creative chops out of making a movie, that the money is pales before the, the satisfaction of having your ideas your performance, your yeah. writing, your framing, your lighting, be there. That yeah. creative stuff is just, it's just, um, you know, the people who are doing a creative part of a movie, if they have their rent paid and they've got their kids taken care of, and they'll do it for nothing. Yep. They'll pay you to do it. Yep. But the guys who really make the money are like the executive producers, the bankers. The bankers make the money. You know, the further they get away, they get nothing out of the movie right. except money. Right. Maybe they go to the to the gala opening or something. Yeah, so they go to the premiere. But you know what? It's not that much fun to go to a premiere when you aren't one of the people who actually did it. Is in the movie. You know what I mean? If you're not one of the then your whole the whole point of it is you get to be around the stars yeah. and stuff. So true. it is, you know, if you want to make money in movies, get into, you know, you know, um, completion bond guarantors. <laughs> 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 you know, get into banking to lend gap financing. Right. All that stuff is where the... That's the, where it's at. Well, I, I remember a, a friend of mine who makes a lot of movies for asylum. Um they pay nothing, um, but he um, made some. But he had a he make stuff outside of it to low budget stuff, mm -hmm. and he showed me a contract that that he had. Another friend of mine was producing; he was directing. They showed me the contract that they had with with the financier, and the movie I think was about it was all about three two net. Two, eight, three million dollars, say. And you know, more than you read the contract, well over half of the move of the budget went directly to the guys that set up the deal. Clint, we're in our own business. Yeah. They they could I've been in a meeting with a with a guy who we were talking about like 10 pictures, and he had a studio in Europe, in Eastern Europe. And he was going to, we had all these projects. And he said, listen, he said, if this was just one movie, I wouldn't even talk to you about it. But since it's 10, um, it's worth it for me to do this. But I just want to tell you out front, I don't want to read the script. And I don't <laughs> want to see the movie. Because all I want to know is who's in it that I can sell. Damn. Wow. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I mean, that's it's what you got to do, man. If that's what you're, that's the name no, of the I'm game. I'm just saying, that's yeah. another side of, of yeah. the movie business. Oh, yeah. 
you know, but of course, you know, the, the mythology of it is that the movies, it's like a, it's a artistic expression of the director who's, you know, if only the suits didn't get in the way, it would be brilliant. And, um, you know, and it's great artistry and social commentary. And, well, thank you know, God it didn't happen with your movies because. Like, how do you get money out of it? You know? <laughs> Thank if, God if nobody you got in your way. A, you want to make a move and make a living. You know? yeah. Otherwise, it's a hobby, which is okay too. Yeah. You know, you can be right. someone who kind of gets together with your bluegrass group on the weekends. Right. And plays the family and friends, or you can be someone who tours. <laughs> yeah. You know, tours the, the South playing bluegrass and at festivals and being on the road and making money, you know, it's, it's tough being on the road. Mm, oh, no doubt, yeah. no doubt. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to ask you one more, one more question. Let's see if I can get this one out of you. So out of all the movies that you've made, if you could remake one of them for modern times, which one would it be and why? It's probably going to be the obvious answer. Oh, I don't know what the answer would be. I'm thinking. Oh well, <laughs> I'm trying always. to. I'm trying to think of what would benefit the most from yeah. it. Yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to. I'm thinking. I don't know. I guess one that I, I, I'm almost takes. thinking. It's Giver. Oh, dude, Giver. The one would be that, amazing. No, I, I'm just saying because that movie. I really thought we had. You know, I've made a number of movies where I thought this is the one I'm going to get rich on. You know, this is going to be it. Yeah. And Geiger was one of those because we have, I don't know, man. I think they're about as good a monster suit as yes. ever. Any yes. budget in the movies. Okay. We have the creature from the Black Lagoon, the original is considered the best monster suit ever. Okay. Um, it had to swim for heaven's sake. Right? Yeah. Right. And we have Predator, the yeah. original. Yeah. But monster suits, you know, the the, the guys the guys who made who directed Guyver, Screaming Mad George and Steve Wang, are both effects artists. And Steve Wang worked on um, Predator. Mm -hmm. So you can see the same kind of painting style. The um, they did all the designs, they directed it, they built the costumes, and these were of course low budgets. It's not like they were, you know, modern a high budget monster suit has air conditioning. <laughs> They're not. I mean, it's kind of dangerous to wear those suits. When we made From Beyond, well, that's not a bad one to remake either. That's not. We made when we made from beyond the suit that Dr. Pretorius, when he was all melting, you know, it's kind of dangerous. You can't stay, you have to be able to move. Mm -hmm. If you stay still for too long, you'll pass out. Oh, yeah. And you get hot, your your skin doesn't breathe. But anyway, with the Giver, those guys even did come through. And it had more freaking ammo in it. Huh? It had Mark Hamill in it. I know. We, we had Luke Skywalker turn into a giant insect and die. Yeah. I mean, come on. A movie that has Mark Hamill turn into a big insect and die? This is, I mean, talk about, I, I can't believe people don't talk about that. You know? I love, I love. And we have Kid Dynamite. Yeah. You know? and, but but the, I, I think the point is because that movie, I thought I know it was uneven, and I think it was uneven because the directors are very different, even though they're both super talented effects artists. Um, Screaming Mad George is really artistical, and Steve Rang Wang is super into, uh, you know, the fun of Kung Fu and everything. And they both took Aikido from Steven Seagal. <laughs> believe it or not <laughs> and wow so they but they split up the scenes yeah they didn't get
get together like the Coen brothers and decide each scene and follow each scene as it was being shot. One of them took one scene, then the other one took another. So we checkerboarded the scenes and we had two crews going. So they were shooting at the same time. So the, the movie is a bit right. unbalanced that way. Plus, I think, and we did, I mean, they did incredible um, in-camera special effects. Because you got to remember, this was before digital. Yeah. It, you know, upside down hanging miniatures. They did all kinds of puppetry and stuff. Well, I think the ending monster, the giant monster at the end, um, could be improved upon. I'm watching it, trailer and, for it right now. Huh? And I love it. I'm so and, watching it. I'd love this yeah. fucking movie. I'm sorry. And I, love I think it. that the, the, the tone of it could be hit a sweet spot, you know. So to a certain degree, that that would be a movie. Looking at a lot of movies that I've been involved with, I don't know, that one, because I feel like it really didn't perform or wasn't really kind of accepted to the degree mm. that I hope. I mean, none of them are, but you know what I'm saying. It's yeah. I just feel like it should have, there's just so much good in it. And I feel like, man, if you, maybe that would be a good one to redo. I mean, still with suits, but Damn it, oh, yeah, yeah. better be There's suits. something there. I mean, that talked about a franchise, you know. You're not, you know, you know it's biomechanical armor. It's really crazy that, you know, and especially, you know, and I'm I'm kind of big into anime a little bit, and it's funny because two of your two of your projects, Crying Freeman and the guy were based on, you know, manga and, and stuff like that. And they actually turned Guyver into an into a, um an anime and it wound up being pretty badass but well they made the anime before we made the movie yeah so and, i'm like they... and the one that got away the one i was working on that we didn't make was devil man oh my god this would have been really that great. would have been amazing tough one crying freeman just never got released in north america so nobody knows about it but it's a beautiful movie absolutely 100 it's, really it's been and christoph gans the guy who who directed it a French director, he became a huge director in, in France. So he makes he makes sixty million dollar or euro movies in France. He did um, he did Silent Hill first. Yeah, I'm looking. He did Brotherhood of the Wolf, Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, Holy crap. Beauty and the Beast is his big one. Wow. Yeah. But he started. He, he, we made Necronomicon as a test for him, so the Japanese would accept him to direct Frank Freeman. So if you haven't seen Necronomicon, that's another one that would be fun. I, I think if I read, I would do Necronomicon, but I wouldn't necessarily do the same stories. I think I would, I'd love to do Necronomicon as another compilation movie with Lovecraft stories with different directors. You know, I love I that you. I love that, that you said. Movie. I love that you said the movies that you've said. Like it wasn't just right to reanimate or right to Honey I Shrunk the Kids. It was Giver and and Necronomicon. That's that's awesome. And I, and that I think really that just proves how how amazing your work is. Is the fact that well actually we can kind of attest to it because reanimator doesn't need to be remade. I mean let's let's face it. I mean the movie is damn near perfect how it is i mean it's and what what more are you going to do with it besides like you said add digital this that the other i mean it's perfect as it is with the practical effects it has i could definitely see the guyver after you saying it just because there's so many things that have been done like you know as far as like with the with the suits like obviously power rangers has been it's been done but to see that in like a modern time would be amazing yeah, I think that I think the Guyver could work. I think it could work. I think that it would be tough to find someone who could. I mean, maybe 
maybe Steve Wang could pull it off, you know, because um, he has that sense of fun and and satire almost yeah. of the genre. But who knows, you know, maybe, I don't know. I, I think the inclination, I mean, I did get contacted by a studio once that wanted to try to make a series of sort of Guyver universe movies. And, um, but I get the feeling that they would, it would, they would try to make it too straight, you know, too, I, I think the, I think the fun of it is the, is the suits. Oh yeah. And I'm not saying that everything has to be clunky. No. And, but trying to find that edge, it's kind of trying to get someone, you know, when I made the sequels to Reanimator, it's just that I was so focused on trying to capture that ironic edge that Stuart gave to the first one. Mm -hmm. So I was really trying to keep it in that world, you know, keep it in that kind of tone. Yep. And I think with the Guyver, there's a tone there. It just somehow the movie, I mean, I'm sure if I just watched it right now, I could point out the points where I think it's, you know, where it faltered, right. you know, where it fell a little. And the pieces that I think are just, just great fun, you know, just, the, you know, like the, at the beginning of Guyver, when he first is in the alley and it's being attacked, Yes. by the game and there's this weird thing where they go huh, huh, huh. i love it i love I mean, it it's, it's so hong <laughs> kong kung fu and making fun of it i Not love making it fun of it having fun having it. yeah yeah having and fun with that it. the way that worked i mean that's that's a tone or when when striker the one with the big ears yep. the dynamite guy Yep. Jumps over a wall and he falls right into a movie set with, with I think Quinia, Linnea Quigley. Yep. Scream Queen. And, yep. And the director is what's his name? Mike D, who's worked on all the he's an effects guy. He worked on all the effect, you know, he's a I, I don't know who he worked for then, probably George or Steve Johnson. I mean, he's like one of the standard effects guys. But a good actor, and he's directing, and the striker falls in. I don't know. I just think that's funny. It's that's, just, it's, it's just meta. It's, you know, it's just like this is just, we're just having fun. Here, yeah, you know. And I think the the kind of effects that Steve Wang and Screaming Mad George did with the zonoids in their tubes, and I don't know that stuff is. I think it. I. I mean, I think that a lot of that stuff you lose if you get too Christopher Nolan with it. You know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If you get too into the CGI, you lose that. It's kind of like with the the um, Harry House and um, Medusa. Yeah. If those snakes are too smooth, they're not scary. There's something. It's kind of like the original Nightmare on Elm Street. I think the scariest scene in that, well, the first time I saw it, was when Freddy is in the alleyway. And his arm stretch? And his arm stretch. Yeah. Yeah. And those are like two by fours. For, you know, it's like, it's hokey stuff. Yeah, right? but it's scary stuff. But it's... there's something more scary about that than if it had been CG. 100%. Was, it's, 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 it's it's uncanny, I guess, but you know what they call the uncanny valley, the the puppet people. When you can't make, you try to make a human face in puppetry, yep, and it never there, it becomes it's in the uncanny valley. It's actually more disturbing. Than, yeah, that's scary you know, shit. You know? That's when it's like and I think disturbing. The stuff where sometimes stop motion does it. Sometimes it's puppetry. But there's something of it, it's un, it's it's unreal. It's not smooth. It's no, um, it's and terrifying. I think, I hate I think it. that's one of the reasons that puppetry and stop motion and those kinds of techniques can give you 
kind of more of a heart attack than, you know, I mean, so much of the, I remember when the mummy came out, the, the, the remake and, um, um, Andrew Voslo played the, the, the mummy mm -hmm. in that. And I had worked with him on Progeny and he was the lead in it. And we went and I said, hey, I want to go see the, the Friday it opened. I said, let's go down to Hollywood Boulevard. I want to see the mummy with the mummy, you know. And we went to watch the movie. And I remember seeing it and seeing that, I mean, it was a, a comedy too mm -hmm. but you know it was kind of a big romp but when Arnold Voslo he was first the the I don't know the Egyptian guy then yeah. his face kind of kind of decayed mm -hmm. so his whole belief below, below his cheeks it was it was gory and open yeah. and it was done CG and I remember looking at it, I said, if that wasn't CG, if that was done with a puppet, if that was done with rubber, that would have been X'd out by the MPAA. Yep. But because it was CG, it didn't have the impact. And so it was PG. Yeah. PG-13 or whatever yep. it was. It was, it said the same thing. But not in the same way. If it had been rubber, forget it. That could not, you couldn't put it in there. Nope. So there is something about puppets and rubber. I know, you know, Screaming Man George can put his hand in a sock and make it come to life. He can make that sock come to life because a puppet is a performance. When you put it in digital, when you go to CG, you have layer upon layer. And you have the guy who makes the animatic and the guy who puts the skin on it and mm -hmm. the guy who does the lighting and the guy you know the guy who does the wetness and you have all these layers and you basically have a very sophisticated animation which is not to say that animation can't yeah, be put thing. one guy putting his hand in his sock yeah and and i love the fact that you you brought that up and and it's a shame because like you said it CG gets a pass because it's people know it's it's not real. You know, you can tell it's CG. Well, it's 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 that it's I think you read it subconsciously as being animation somehow. Yep. And which is not to say that animation can no. be incredible. Sure. Right? But it's not done that way. And so I think that's part of the I think that if you did a, a remake of Diver, ideally, the way I would see it would be to keep the suits, you know, um, keep the the keep the earthbound um, action of it. Yep. Yep. But enhance it. I would certainly use CG. Oh you know? yeah, I mean, and I would just. But then the trick is to you want to enhance it. So, you know, it's just like with the, but I think it's still fun to do the, you know, the kind of effects in the, you know, what is the master of the flying guillotine, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, the Hong Kong movies used to do it. They had wires, it's like how Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, like, and, like have, have you know, that kind everything of. Everything was overdone. They yeah. fly through the air, but it was practical. Exactly. And it looked much better than a Avengers movie. Or like the Matrix. The I'm thinking of the, the Matrix Avengers with the fighting in the Avengers. Yep. I don't know. I mean, I know it's a big deal to to uh, you know whole generations of film film goers. I can't I if I never saw another superhero movie, I would be You wouldn't care. Okay. Because it's yeah, no, no because right it there just, with you. It, it doesn't I don't I don't even kind of get why it's so popular, but I try not to say that. I, I guess you have to play a lot of video games to understand it. We gotta, we, we, Clint, we gotta right? cut this so part I'm out. Not on, yeah, I'm not playing Fortnite and 
you know, Call of Duty. Come on, Brian. We, I don't want to edit a lot of this video. We're going to have to cut this entire end. I know. Out. You're going you're gonna to lose Jeez, your whole yeah, audience. Yeah, the whole audience is gone now. <laughs> well, I'm Never just telling work. you, that's, what, that's, that's the truth. But no. I do think that that changes how you see superhero movies. I agree. Because I know that there's, you know, a lot of people think, though, I mean, ultimately, it's probably as sophisticated as movie making gets for this era, you know, in mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 years, somebody's going to be looking back at the Avengers like we look at Jaws. From. Yeah, probably and so. And it will look really clunky. And I mean, when I see the Avengers, I kind of see some actors with a green screen behind them and then the whole universe projected art placed in. I mean, it just looks like people in front of these amazing artworks, you know. That's and what it is. I don't know. You know. That's unfortunately that's that's <laughs> what it is. I mean we won't go there. We won't sorry go. guys, that's what I it is. I did make a superhero movie. I did make um Faust oh. Love of the Day. <laughs> okay. I guess we'll that, that was my attempt to do Dark Man about 20 years after Sam Raimi. Dark Man was incredible. That is one of my that is one of my favorite superhero yeah. movies, if you want to call it that. It so, is a superhero movie. It's fantastic. It, I, is. I it love just it. doesn't have the CGI effects. I I actually have a copy on VHS of the Fantastic Four made by Roger Corman. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think this was in the 70s or something. Yep. And they had to make a movie or else they lost the rights. And I'm trying to remember who gave it to me, somebody who did the effects on it. I mean, it is cheap. Oh, it's cheesy as all hell. Oh, but it's <laughs> it's something about it though. It's like the it's like the uh like how Captain America was. Like when that when that first came out way back when, same way with the with the Punisher, you know, Dolph Lundgren as the Punisher. You know, it was the same thing. It was like that corny, hokey, but it was, it, but it was, but it was all real. It was all practical. It was all what it should have been. So yeah, Fantastic Four, that is a trip. That movie is pure well, insanity. I think, I think what changed, I think superhero movies are so ubiquitous now because they absolutely take advantage of CGI. They're just nothing takes advantage of CGI like superhero movies. But there's also a point of it. I think that um, what's the name of um, the guy who plays Iron Man? Robert um, Downey Jr. Yeah, Robert Downey Jr. opened the door to every actor in Hollywood wanting to do with superheroes because he he was like he was a drug addict that couldn't get hired you know he was a yep. great a great talent who just went down the tubes and just couldn't get hired and he agreed to do the movie and he put he put kind of high talent um energy into being iron man and that was it i think he created that whole that whole genre in I think he yeah. died, didn't he? On the last one, the last spoiler alert. Last if you haven't day. seen that movie yet, spoiler alert. Yes, he does die. I've got but to, I'll tell you. Anyway, that. I think that um, he really created it. You know, I, I think, agree. I mean, I think what, what's the one, The Dark Knight, or the what, what is the first Batman? Batman well, Begins. First, we had um, um, what's his name? Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Doing yeah. Batman, but that was before CGI. That is, that's so my. He Batman. did it very cartoony, and then, but CGI. I'm trying to remember. Was it Batman Begins? Or, Batman Begins was the first Batman one Nolan did. Times. I mean, for my money, I mean, to me, it just seemed like it was going. You know, it didn't. It wasn't like the comics, you know. But they were really powerful. You know, it was like a big movie. You know, they really took these characters much more seriously than comic books ever did. You know? But on the one hand, I also think that before Night, uh, Return of Living Dead, all the comic book, like the EC Comics horror movies, 
it's like creep show and stuff. They tried to make them look like comic book friends, thinking that that was it was the equivalent of like, you know, the Batman TV show or something. When Dan O'Bannon made Return of Living Dead, he made EC Comics on screen. And after that, everybody knows how to do it, you know. There would be no Tales from the Crypt back in the 80s without Return of Living Dead. Oh, yeah. Dan O'Bannon kind of solved the riddle, and Joel Silver just took it and ran. Oh, yeah, took it and ran. As and now as people know how to do that. You know, we see lots of movies in the style of Return of Living Dead mm -hmm. um, to one degree or another. Yeah, but you realize that you can have your cake and eat it too with the with the comic book kind of texture and yet do great gooey effects and you know. I'll take my great gooey effects. I'll watch your animator over the Avengers any day <laughs> of the week. You can quote well, me on that. Avengers isn't a horror. Movie. You're right. I watch Guyver over Avengers. I don't know the Guyver. I think you watch it in pieces. I think I've watched that movie too it's many times. One of those times. movies that I think there's somehow it just didn't kind of come to. I, I I've watched that movie way I too many think, times. I, I didn't think I was going to get a a huge estate in Malibu off that movie, but it kind of didn't work out. I think you should have. <laughs> I think you should have been by default. <laughs> the fact that you made the movie just didn't sell the way it should have. You know, should have been should have been huge. So that should have been. I'd Should like to see that again. Now, From Beyond would be a good one to remake. I would love to see that. Some of, you know, that one really could have used a little help from CGI. Yeah. You know, yeah. Really just a little boost. Because it, you know, it's just a cool idea. You know? It's a great it's idea. Going into the beyond, you know, with some umbilical cord, you know. That movie's amazing. I still say ticks. I'm going to go... Clint, wouldn't you like to see remake of Ticks? Hell yeah, I would. <laughs> Ticks would be good, you know. I feel like Ticks, yeah, I would have to watch it again. It, um, I know there were a few scenes that I, I, there was one scene in particular that I kind of added in the middle of the, when we were in the middle of production, which is the one in the, in the, um, Vet's office. Oh God! It gets loose, and yeah. I, and I, and the reason was is I was thinking about these um, insect monster movies. I like I like that genre, you know, the giant insect or they were all giant in ticks. Right. You just get Rocky Mountain spotted fever, or you get what is it? Take disease or Lyme, uh, Lyme disease. Lyme disease. Yeah. Huh? Lyme disease. Lyme. Yeah, Lyme's, you know, it's but that's the whole point of horror, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. You just take regular stuff and exaggerate it until <laughs> it's fun, right? Yes. And right. um and that I felt like, you know, it's kind of like that guy who wrote the movie, um, Brent Friedman, who also worked on um necronomicon he worked with all with the writer the japanese the french and me uh for the american um episodes where he kind of made them more hollywood type stories and he's a he's a great writer he ended up doing a lot of um i mean he writes for I think he made a TV show called Dark Skies. And he ended up making work. He wrote a bunch of the Clone Wars episodes and he does video games. He's like a genius kind of guy who, who in new media. And, and he wrote Ticks. And it was kind of the part of it that, you know, sometimes writers focus on a certain part of the movie that maybe a producer doesn't. So he was really focused on this idea of Seth Green, I think, played the character. Yeah. That's like afraid. It's a bunch of like kind of juvenile delinquents that get sent to the woods, I think was the story. Right. 
Yeah, and they kind of bump into these the this marijuana cultivators, um, gangster types that that are using some kind of steroidal fertilizer or something. Fertilizer <laughs> that makes six things, right? So that was but writers tend to focus so much on the characters. And so he really and I think that had a great cast with Amy Dolan. Oh my God, yes. Seth Green and I mean they were the Virginia Keen. Alfonso Riviera. <laughs> Uh, it, had Car- it had Carlton in it from Fresh yeah. Prince. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And you know what? I his father kept we kept we worked on trying to do a, another script that Brent had called Life Without Joe that to make as a vehicle for him. So I dealt with his father a lot and him because we because they just we needed to have a fee because an actor. It's nothing without a movie that they ride like a horse, you know? Yeah. And, and of course, he was always overshadowed by Will Smith. Everything oh, yeah. Will Smith. But anyway, yeah, great, great kids, right? What a great, great cast. Yeah. But um, there was, I felt like sometimes the, I just feel like sometimes with monsters or, if they get too big, it's a different thing, you know. But there's a certain point at which you don't want to see it. You want it. You want to close it in and show and have it not always be have a scene where it's scary, but it's not. It's it's not apparent. And so that was the idea of that scene in the vet's office, was you get you get kind of the alien chest. Break or what, what do they call it? The chest chest burster burster or something, and then it runs around and you don't know where it is. So it to me that's like a monster movie. Yeah, that and is a hundred percent a monster movie. And sometimes if you're and I did and we did a I did a lot of the <laughs> with with crew people. We did a lot of the ticks running through the grass. We got monofilament. We were pulling them, just trying to get shots. Because we didn't have, we did we just didn't have um, CGI, right? And I think at the end the tick gets real big or something, you know. And I don't know, man. It's it didn't it didn't turn out as well as we had hoped, and that's why that opening scene was shot was to give it the because once again, writers tend to not write that exploitative opening scene they tend to like they have a vision for the story and sometimes you gotta you go hey you gotta hook people in early and i think i think clint howard really did the job oh he killed it that oh, could be a good one absolutely yeah that, i like the idea of the kids the delinquent kids going into the you know being at a yeah at a camp and then there's some natural phenomena yeah, and you know what's crazy is you have a lot of these movies like ticks rottweiler <laughs> um well, Arach- like, Arach- like, 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 <laughs> like damn like it's and they get they just it, it's crazy because they're actually good movies too that's you know on on our spectrum they're good movies so i i enjoy them um what's the other one was it uh amphibious i think it's another one Creatures yeah, of the Deep. Well, that's, they all have their stories. No, yeah, that's for sure. I can that tell was that. in Indonesia. Total Indonesian crew shooting during Ramadan. Oh, God. Mm. I bet that was fun. Nobody would eat or drink water from sunrise to sunset. Wow. Whole crew. Wow. I did it for two days. I thought, I'm going to try to see. What is this like if you do? I, I, drank, I did, drank a little water. I just thought that's not healthy. Not, because we were out on the sea, we were yeah. on the edge of the sea in a little village, dirt village, of um, during Ramadan. So they prayed like forever, and there's always some, you know, oh, 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 oh. we could see Krakatoa from where we were working. Krakatoa is a big volcano, Kano, yeah, island, yeah. 
but it was it was fascinating to work there and you're working with a crew that I don't know it's different with an Indonesian crew I can only imagine I'm sure it is <laughs> yeah sure I did a movie is. I bet you've never seen try me in Indonesia called Takut Faces of Fear yeah okay you've probably seen it <laughs> so come on now so that's talk of that's a no budget movie and it has six different Indonesian directors and six different Indonesian producers. Yeah, because it's, it's uh, six it, different it, stories. It, well, I I was supposed to do a lot of movies in Indonesia. And I was looking for, I just wanted to see the talent out there and how they made movies. They didn't even do post in Indonesia when I was there. I spent three years there. Wow. They did post in um, Bangkok. Now that now I think they do post in Indonesia, but it was I mean I loved Indonesia. It's too bad. The only reason I I left was because the um, Great Recession happened. You know when the capital markets collapsed mm -hmm. in two thousand eight nine. We were financed by a, my my partner. One of my partners was a, a hedge fund. Have a hedge fund in in, in Singapore. And so this was one of their small projects was to build movie theaters. He was building multiplexes. And then I was going to make movies in Indonesian language to put on in the multiplexes. And so the first thing we did, I tried to make like a, uh, a compilation movie and see, see what they could do. I mean, it's kind of primitive. Yeah. The, the 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 industry there it's kind of primitive and I didn't use anybody from outside of Indonesia it was nope. all and it was it's in Indonesian language so it was on it's on I, I found it on Prime I found it on Prime and yeah. rented it and oh, I was the like, last mm -hmm. episode the first episode is very artistic that's mm -hmm. very good and the last episode with the Mo brothers that could be they could they could work in Hollywood, no problem. They, uh, they, they could have taken that. And while Hollywood. I was making that, I visited the set of, I tried to make, remember the name of it, but it was the the guy who made the raid. What's his name? Um, you know the raid, that action movie? Yeah, I know the, know the um, movie. I can't remember who the... He's a British guy, but he was married to an Indonesian. And he's making a movie called Mara Tooth or something. It was action. He's into action. I visited the set, and he was on his 116th day of shooting. God, <laughs> like Indonesia. You know, in Indonesia, like when we shot um, the um, amphibious, they they sign on for the show. It's kind of like in Japan. You work as many days as you. It's not like there's a union there telling you. If you want to work 15 hours, you work 15 hours. You don't take a day off until you have to. Wow. If you go over schedule, you go over schedule. <laughs> That's wow. The budget. Yeah. So but once you're once you're in, you're in. Something, it's tough to make something that looks Western. That's oh, I'm sure. But I really had a great um, I really had a great ambition to make a bunch of movies in Indonesia and make them like, uh, and use their mythology, their monsters, their creatures. Because, you know, you kind of get tired of the werewolf, the vampire, Frankenstein. And, well, yeah, you know, well, I mean, you can, stuff. ghost, that's, ghost, that's ghost was a big one. Done done. But yeah. you go over to Southeast Asia and they have a whole different. Oh, it's a whole different mythology. philosophy. Oof. Yeah, ghosts are ghosts are big thing. I'm working with a friend now to make a movie based on the Blood Island movies of this early '60s. Um, have you seen Terror is a Man, Blood I Beast of Blood Island, and, and um, uh, Brides of Blood Island, or something? So these are made in the Philippines, and they have all the same kind of monsters that they have in Indonesia because that whole area shares the culture hmm. so we, in order to to get the you know we know that nobody would read the script so we made a comic book that 
covered part of the strip. I'll show you the cut. This is awesome. This is awesome. Now maybe maybe you'll you will remember this movie when you see the comic, you know. That's from, yeah, that's that's really familiar. Yeah, here's the an alternate cover. You, know? you have to have an alternate cover. And it's just full of monsters, you know. I want to buy those. <laughs> Dude, that's gorgeous artwork. It is. It's Steven Sestilli. And he um he's a great, he's really good. No he's doubt. Really good. Right, and it's real oh. old old style. You know? yeah. But that's awesome. You know, there's the... <laughs> but that's a the same sort of thing. It's trying to do those kind of monsters. You know, the the, the Southeast Asia just has God. It's, they just have the weirdest creatures. And oh monsters. yeah, oh yeah. It's the main. Think yeah, like I guess ghosts. Ghosts are a big thing. Ghost stories are a big thing. Um, can I knew cannibals are a big thing. Um, and it just yeah, are more. I have the movies that these are based on. Let me see if I got That's it. what I want to see. I really want Guyver to be remade. Well, I don't see the um, the box set, but here's a collector's edition of Ticks. I'm not sure if you have it. Love it, Clint. You got that? Hey. Oh my! Do you don't have no, that? Clint? I, I don't. I don't have that. What the hell is wrong with you? I don't know. I love that poster. That poster's. I mean, awesome. that is awesome. like. It's like. That's a horror movie I want to see. Yeah, a hundred percent. This is this is the real deal, you know. That movie's amazing. I don't care what anybody says about that movie. That movie is incredible. <laughs> Hey, you know, it's got oh, it's got its charms. Not yeah, a great movie, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you've got to enjoy what you can. I agree. Hey, listen, guys, it was great to talk to you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry and, to keep you on uh, it for so long. Hope to do it again. Well, there'll be a part two. There has to be. And good luck. Hey, man. Uh, uh, again, I thank you so much for hopping on here with us. Sorry to keep you on here for half your evening, but I can tell you this has been one of our best interviews. You have been phenomenal yeah. to talk to and uh, what's the name of the podcast again the uh, hammityville horror podcast and where are you located we are everywhere spotify <laughs> Apple. i mean where are you located? oh i am in virginia he's in pennsylvania pennsylvania okay so you're in philly or um like south central pennsylvania um uh near gettysburg that new jersey i heard south of south of philly is new jersey <laughs> <He's> Gettysburg. <laughs> no. Well, I yeah, did go area. in May. Yeah. I went to a drive-in, the Mahoney. Mahoney, drive that's right. Because you did Mahoney, the, yeah, yeah, we've been there. Because so you were I there for there. Reanimator, weren't you? I, there was a few movies. Yeah, there was a few movies. Yeah, and it was really, a lot of fun. Yeah, we went there yeah. for uh, Catherine Mary Stewart place. and uh, uh, Kelly Maroney for uh, Night of the Comet and Last Starfighter. Oh, yeah. Night of the Comet. That's yeah, the, so that was, so that was yeah. a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, we're a uh, starfighter. That was wow. uh, that could have been huge. Could have been huge. Could have been. Yeah. Could have been huge. It was. But my big regret was that I didn't get to go see a Phillies game when I was there. Damn. The next time. There's still time. There's still time. There's still a team, for now. <laughs> but look, uh, Brian, again, um, thank you so much for hanging out with us, man. This has been, it's been educational, if 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 anything. Oh yeah. We've had a lot of fun learning from Makes you. Makes so. me think that you skipped school a lot. I did, and I watched your movies, so I have you to thank for that. But I still graduated, so I was okay. I watched Reanimator more than I should have. That's okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, man, we'll have to do this again because it has been an absolute blast. Okay, guys. All right, man. Have a good I'll night. And thank you again. Yeah. Thank you so much.